Good morning. How are you doing? Welcome to Legacy. Hey, excited about, uh, give it up for Jose. I thought he did a great job up here, kind of <laughs> catching us up. And you got to admit, the guy always looks sharp too. Always looks sharp. I, he got a new cut today, new looking, looking sharp. I said, hey, Jose, what would it, could I pull off a cut like that? And because uh, I, I, I was really complimenting. I was like, could I? He goes, no, maybe in heaven. Thanks, man. Thanks. Love you. Yeah. Uh, we are, uh, he mentioned the uh, business meeting. We're going to talk at the business meeting as well and give a, uh, a, a snapshot of sort of what's going on. The, uh, uh, the drawings are uh, of the, the facility <laughs> are being, the, the renderings are, we're coming down to the home stretch literally this week, a couple of meetings to fine tune some things. Uh, you'll be happy to hear this. Uh, like we're trying to get a bigger kitchen, like a more of a commercial size kitchen, right? We've been using a break room for seven years. It's a break room uh, with a microwave oven. And yeah, so it'd be shocked to see all the, the banquets and things that we've ha hosted over the years. So we're, we're working on that, fine tuning that. You'll hear more about the facility and uh, talk about that together. So that's at the business meeting. You don't want to miss that. That'll be a, a great opportunity. A new series, uh, Upside Down Kingdom. That's going to take us right into Easter Sunday. And uh, we are, uh, uh, we, we're, we're going to, this will be our, literally our last, well, I, I, I don't know if I should say this, but could potentially be our last Easter gatherings here in this facility. So we're going to do three a three in one. Last year, we, we were just nearing 800 people at our Easter gatherings. So we talk about uh, needing, a, a, needing three gatherings. It's, it's, it's for a very good reason. Um, so you want to invite well and consider s serving in one and then sitting in one uh, as we get closer and closer. We'll talk more about that. Uh, this series, uh, again, will lead us to Easter, which springtime. Come on, give it up for springtime. <laughs> Spring means flowers. Spring denotes sunshine. <laughs> Allergies. <laughs> Sunshine denotes, come on, golf. Ah, yeah. Right, amen. I got biggest amen I'll get all this morning probably right there. So looking forward for the spring. We love spring around here. We're going to be in the book of Mark together for the next several weeks. And the book of Mark is a fast-moving, fast-paced gospel narrative. So you want to uh, fasten your seatbelt. We're going to be moving quickly. Uh, today, I want to give you some background, a little bit of foundation to build the series into, and then uh, some application at the end that will uh, kind of launch us into the week together. Each of the gospel writers, it's interesting, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels, each of them have a... a a different lens by which they, they, they view Jesus and, and really uh, communicate to us the life and ministry of Jesus. For different lenses. For example, Matthew sees Jesus as king. Mark sees Jesus as servant. Luke, Jesus as, as God. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, Luke, Jesus as man. And John, Jesus as God. And these four sort of perspectives kind of give you a kaleidoscope perspective. You see kind of full-orbed, full-perspective look of who Jesus is and all of his, the nuances of his life between the four Gospels. Right now, our, our men's, uh, we're walking through uh, the Bible and on, on uh, Thursday mornings. We're right now in the book, of, we've been in the book of Leviticus for a few. How many of you know when you can dive into the Gospels for a little bit? Like, like we've been talking about ceremonial cleansings for a lot, like about the last three weeks. And, and so it's nice to get in some gospel together. Always try to stay in the gospel as much as possible when you're working through the, through the Bible. But we get these pictures of Jesus that are, that are pretty awesome. And Mark, again, Jesus as servant. He's the first written account on the life of Jesus is Mark. He, it, the, the book is written to Christians in Rome, and it's around 25 or 30 years 
after Jesus' death and resurrection. And at this point, there's no other written accounts of the gospel narrative. Isn't that interesting? Everything, it's been spreading uh, verbally, orally. It's been, it's been taught. And, and, and this, again, 25 to 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and it's, as, you, as you kind of study and you dig down into it, scholars are saying, because of this fact, 25, 30 years after Jesus' res- death and resurrection, it was really hard to distort the, the narrative of who Jesus was and his ministry. Why? Because every, there's so many people were still alive. You couldn't just say, yeah, you know, Jesus used to hover above the crowd when he'd go from town to town. There's too many people alive. They would say, uh, no, actually he walked. Right? Because there are people living in that that were there. For example, go to when you go to First uh, First Corinthians 15, which was written 15 to 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul writes, "For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received: that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures." that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Most of them are still alive. So if you have any questions on the narrative, if you have any questions on things I'm writing down, just go out. There's plenty of people around that, had, that were eyewitnesses and they're still living and they're still alive. So you know when you're reading the book of Mark, <clears throat> you're getting a clear representation of who Jesus is. You're not getting a fabricated Jesus. Anybody glad about that? You're not getting some propped up version of Jesus. You're, getting, you're not getting a Jesus to sort of fit our tastes, our idiosyncrasies, our weaknesses. You're getting a Jesus who's real. You're getting a Jesus that transforms lives, the Jesus that challenges lives, the Jesus that calls us to a higher place, the Jesus that, that we can adapt our lives to, not the other way around. In fact, Tim Keller writes, he says it this way. He says, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John took eyewitness accounts, wove them together so that we could have the real Jesus. Not a made-up Jesus or a Jesus of our own, but the real Jesus as he actually was. What he really said and what he really did. Luke writes it this way. He says, Dr. Luke, uh, in his gospel, he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught eyewitnesses. They went to eyewitnesses who saw it and they sat down and had conversation to write the narrative. You got to love Mark's approach. Mark's approach, he hits you with rapid succession stories, accounts. I mean, it's Jesus on the move. You see Jesus in living color. He doesn't start his gospel at the nativity like some of the other writers he introduces immediately goes to john the baptist preaching in the wilderness and baptizing then he goes to to baptizing jesus and then jesus being tempted in the wilderness by satan and then calling his first disciples and then launching out into into his ministry and then uh, uh, rebuking the pharisees right and then going to levi's house matthew's house for dinner with all of the pharisees in fact the pharisees said why does he even hang out with such scum he, he ticked off the Pharisees and the Sadducees, led, this, led to this conflict. These were, these were the early disciples. There were like four of them at this point that followed Jesus, that were walking with, had, it didn't even have the full crew yet. But I can only imagine the early disciples' takeaway because they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They must have thought to themselves, this is amazing. I mean, we're like, we're on team Jesus. 
Like we're, we're a powerful force with Jesus. Like people are really impressed with us. Like power by association. Everybody wants to be on a winning team. And like, folks, this is a winning team. But Jesus captures this, I'm sure. He sets the record straight. And if you were to read through the pages of the, the gospel of Mark and ask yourself this question, what is the what is the key verse of scripture, verse or verses of scripture here that the, this book hinges on? You would find yourself, and commentators uh, uh, back this up, you would find, as you, as you look at all of it collectively, you would land at Mark chapter 10 and verse 44, verses 44 and 45, where Jesus comes in and he presents a posture that's radically different from maybe what others anticipated. He says, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In fact, I, I would just invite you, can we just together read that out loud and loudly together? Come on, reading. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I looked at that word, you know, that word slave must be a slave of all. That's a, that's a tough word to, to kind of navigate around. In fact, you look at all the other, a lot of the other translations and they have the same word. There's no way to soften that. In fact, it's the word doulos in the Greek. The word doulos is de defined this way. One who forfeits his own rights in order to serve any and all. So if I were to read that with that word in it, and whoever would be first among you must be one who forfeits his own rights in order to serve any and all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. It's important that we get this right out of the gate. It's important we understand this. That is the hinge that this entire gospel swings on. Because otherwise, then we think that the we think that the narrative, and this is just our propensity. This is just our uh, kind of our default. Our default is to think that it just all sort of wraps around, like the world sort of revolves around us, right? Our preferences, our comfort, our tastes, kind of our consumer mentality. But in the upside down kingdom, it's first position. The first position comes by serving. The last are first. Jesus sets the bar. I come to be served, not to serve. We're, uh, we're walking our... We're walking about um, 25, 26 couples through a transformational parenting course, young families raising kids and just getting some tools. We're just trying to get some tools to, to raise our kids. And we, got, we can have grandparents uh, in, that, in that course on Sunday afternoons. If, if, if I'm not careful and I don't know how to, how to leverage biblically based tools out for my kids, my default mechanism tends to be child-centered parenting. And child-centered parenting basically is where, where mom and dad sort of revolve around the kids. Like every, everything revolves like the solar system, the kids are in the middle and, and everything else revolves around them. So at, where, where parents revolve around every whim and whimper of the child, we send them then, and here's the tragedy of it, here's the, the struggle of it. We send them out into a world ill-prepared, thinking they're the center of everyone's universe, right? And then they sign up for that first job, fill out that first job application, and they go to work, and what do they learn right away? It ain't about you. Like, get in line, pal. But wait, at home, my mom says it's all about me. We don't want to disturb little Johnny while he's sleeping. Yeah, I, that was just my little pet peeve right there, right? 
And so so we, we, we ill train them, right? They're ill prepared. We're, we're, this, with, this, with this hinge, who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a, as a ransom for many, we have to prepare them for this upside down kingdom, is the point. The first or last, last or first passage sets the tone, really, for the entirety of the book of Mark, and for all the gospels for that matter. So I, I'd like us just to pray for a moment as we kind of launch in together. Lord Jesus, I pray you just, Lord, open our hearts, prepare us, God, to hear from you. Lord, say what, by your Holy Spirit what I'm not saying. Clarify what is not clear. Lord, anoint my tongue today. Help me to hide behind your cross, God, so that you're only seen, not Gary's preferences or Gary's. Let, I, I don't want to be preachy, God. I need this as much as anybody. So help lead us by your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever been around somebody who's trying to convince you about a movie you need to go watch? So, and, and, and I'm always a little nervous somebody tells me they want me to see a movie, right? Or we see something really good. Now, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't get permission first gathering to say this about my wife. My wife loves to tell people about a movie or something that we see that they need to go see. Sometimes she just, my wife's got the gift of words. How many would, would say amen to that? So when I say words, the quality of words, I'm not talking about the quantity. Come on now. Quality of the words. But she'll sometimes go into ex explaining, like trying to convince you about, oh, you got to, oh, it was so, and then life, and then and I'll feel a little bit of, like, I don't think they, don't, that's too much. Don't give it away. Right? It's like spoiler alert. So you hear somebody wanting to explain a movie to you. Let's say, for example, the Rocky, so I've had to pick something really old, like the Rocky movies, right? Like these are almost 50 years old, folks. Like if you haven't seen a Rocky movie, sorry, I'm gonna spoil it for you, right? So Rocky won, who does he fight? Apollo, Apollo Creed, of course, Apollo Creed. Rocky two, who does he fight? Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed. It's a rematch, man. It's big. It's big. You walk out of the theater, you're ready to go into fighting, maybe. I mean, you're ready. Right? Rocky Three. Who does he fight? Clubber Lang. Mr. <laughs> Mr. T. Clubber Lang. Pain. Right? Pain. Clever Lang, and you're trying to describe, oh, you got to see Rocky III. It's so good. I mean, Rocky's, Rocky's gotten soft because he's rich now and he's wealthy and, he, and he's got living at the top and, and he has this confrontation with his coach, Mick. He's having this, Mick, cut me, that, that one, right? Mick, and, and he's having this confrontation with Mick and they're talking and, and, and Mick looks at Rocky and Rocky says, you're soft and he's going he's gonna to kill you. In fact, he says these words like the famous line of the movie, he'll knock you to tomorrow. Rock. <laughs> Come on, anybody remember that? Come on. You know that was pretty good, wasn't it, right? He'll knock you out of Mick dies at the end, though. It's like, what? I just ruined the movie. Like, if you had any inkling now to watch Rocky Three, which is 42 years old, okay, so if you haven't seen it now. I mean, that's like, right? No spoiler alert. This is the, this is the spirit and the heart of Mark who writes this gospel. He comes out of the gate. I mean, he's flying. He wants you to know exactly what's, check it out, check it out. Look at it. It's Mark's, in fact, if you're taking notes, you write it th this way. Mark's declaration, John's proclamation, Jesus' demonstration. And we're going to move fast. You ready? Mark's, de Mark's declaration, he's, he's basically saying, the Messiah has come. 
Now you gotta remember, there's been 400 years of quiet, 400 years of oppression, 400 years of no prophetic utterance has been spoken, 400 years of waiting for the promised Messiah, the promised, you got the displaced people all over from Israel, all over the place. Nothing of promise is unveiled until, look it, notice how Mark starts, Mark chapter one, verse one. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. That's how he starts. Like boom, like both barrels. And it began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you and he'll prepare your way. He's a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Mark begins his gospel in a way that is uniquely Mark. No spoiler alert here. Matthew starts with genealogies, remember? Luke starts with a prologue of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, it's awesome stuff. John starts with the creation of the world in the beginning was, he goes all the way back. Mark, it's Jesus, Messiah, he's here. He's saying, watch, you remember Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah? They didn't have Isaiah 40 then, they just Isaiah's prophecy. Do you remember Isaiah's prophecy? The messenger is John the Baptist. The promised Messiah, the Lord, the Son of God is Jesus. Now we hear that and we kind of go, uh, oh yeah, what's for lunch? The Red Robin or the ribeyes? because we know how the story plays out, the account. But the audience that he would have been speaking to, the Jewish audience, to them, when they heard that word, Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, that word was the word Yahweh. That's a mic drop word. The word Yahweh, the name Yahweh is the personal covenant name that God gave to Moses and revealed at the burning bush. Yahweh is the personal name of a covenant God that the Jews considered to be so holy, they wouldn't even speak that name. They wouldn't even write that name down. Like, if, like I wrote it there with, with a, a, a vowel A and an E, Yahweh, they would have left the, the A and the E off and it just would have been an unpronounceable name, Y-H-W-H, too holy to even mention. And Mark launches into the gospel <laughs> before he even explains who Jesus is. He just goes straight to the punchline, Yahweh of Israel, creator God of all the universe, the one we've been waiting for, the promised Messiah, the ruler judge of all the earth has come in the person of Jesus. He's God incarnate, God made flesh. Drop the mic. He's tying a link. He's reaching all the way back to Isaiah and he's tying a link to John, the messenger. He's reaching back again. He's tying a link all the way to the one he's preparing the way for is Jesus. Isaiah 40 says it this way, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places as a plain. That, you know what? Some of you just need to hear that prophetically today over your life, over your family, over your home. The rough places are gonna become level because that's how Jesus is. That's who God is. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. This is what John, this is what Mark was tying this is the narrative that he was tying to this one named John and this one named Jesus.
When Mark starts off his gospel, one commentator writes, with the prophecy of Isaiah, he's rooting the gospel of Jesus Christ into the ancient hope of Israel for a king to come someday. He's saying, in essence, this is that. This is the promised one we've been waiting for. God has come, God incarnate, God made flesh. This is the miracle. This is the fulfillment of that promise. The late Dr. Tim Keller says it this way. He says that God became human through Jesus Christ is the universe sundering, history altering, worldview shattering, life transforming event that sets Christianity apart from every other religion and every other view and every other philosophy on the face of the earth. That's monumental. The idea of God becoming human through Jesus Christ. See, we in our modern thinking, we in our modern thinking could trip up on this. The culture in which we live in, we think we might think, you know, Gary, we're we're kind of I mean, I understand the priv- primitive when I read the, you know, those are primitive people. They're they're kind of, you know, they're not as advanced as we are. Science and technology. But the reality is the Jewish people had, they had far greater barriers than we have to navigate and to cross. It was opposed, the idea of God incarnate, God made flesh. It was opposed to everything they believed. And yet all the original believers, Mark included, were all Jewish people. Even though they had for far more cultural and intellectual barriers than you and I do, far more. Keller writes, the idea that God could become a human being was absolutely, antithetically, utterly opposed to everything they'd been taught about reality, everything they ever knew, everything about their culture and their intellect. It was against all of that, and yet they did. Something shattered those barriers, and the book of Mark, get this, and the book of Mark is Mark's way of showing it to us, what he said, how he acted, And what he did broke that barrier. And they believed. Mark's declaration, the Messiah has come. The Messiah has come. Here's John's proclamation. Write this down. He's so much greater. He's so much greater. So let me read the narrative a little more. It says, this messenger, verse four, was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness. He was a wild man. And he preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes, now we're describing what John wore. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist and for food, he ate locusts and wild honey. And John announced, verse seven, here it is. Here's his proclamation. Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am so much greater that I'm not worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Come on. (laughs) John's proclamation, he's so much greater. Come on. He's so much greater. He's so much greater. We've yet to even capture legacy, his greatness, his vastness. I, I sometimes just enjoy, it's gonna maybe sound weird, but sometimes I just enjoy watching people worship. Do you know what I'm saying? Like when I say that, I, here's what I mean. You see people that are just in worship and I'm not right now, I'm talking about just in worship and song. And you could just tell by their face and their countenance in their heart, 
they're not doing this, you know. You know, there's not, there's no self, they're not self-aware. They're just like lost in the presence of God. Sometimes they just, you know, like, I don't I can't even describe it. It's, it, there's no, there's no, uh, like, there's not a list. You can't YouTube this. Google it. You just know. You just like, that, that person is lost in Jesus. You see that in people's lives, how they live, how they give, how they, how they respond, how they speak. There's, there's just something extraordinary. John said, someone is coming who's greater than I am. He had a powerful ministry going. John, look at the people lined up. They're coming from all over. They're, getting, they're, they're meeting God. He said, I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie his straps of his sandals. He lived an undistracted, did John, life in the wilderness. He stayed away from the noise and the politics. He positioned himself in a place where he could hear best from God. And it really begs the question when I read that, and I think about his life, not, well, that guy's weird, is what do I need to do in my life to stay untethered? What do I do in my life to position myself in such a way that I'm not distracted by the noise of culture and society? John knew his place. He knew his place. Had a powerful ministry. And he said, someone's coming who's greater than I am. He's God, I'm not. He's, prophesied, he's the prophesied one, the coming king, the one that's been prophesied of and about. He's so much greater. I baptize you with water, that outward demonstration of an inward work. Come on. Outward is still powerful, still necessary, still needful, so much so that Jesus did it to begin and launch his ministry for us. He, and he was perfect and sinless. For us, it's a demonstration of what he's done on the inside, and I want the world to know. I don't care who knows. John baptized in the wilderness, and he bragged about this one who was coming to baptize in the Holy Spirit. We see this lived out in Jesus' lives, life in the book of Acts when he said, wait for the promised one to come and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus was like when he was, had his earthly ministry, he was like excited to go away. Like excited, I'm gonna go. I have to go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Come on, everybody said amen to that. I wanna be where Jesus is, right? that where I am, but in the meantime, I'm gonna deposit the Holy Spirit in you. See, at that time, he could only be around Jerusalem. At that time, he was limited to a physical human body. But now by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's around the world. People are worshiping and loving him and hearing about the gospel message. (laughs) It's a movement, ladies and gentlemen. To go and wait for the Holy Spirit. So John's proclamation was he's greater. He had a posture of humility. Once coming is so much greater. Let me give you the last one. Jesus' demonstration. He's come to your wilderness. His demonstration is this. Look at Mark chapter one, verse nine. And I want you just to capture the first line here for a moment. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you're my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Hold it there, hold that slide for just a moment. Right here in this moment, we see the triune Godhead in one scene in scripture, right? God the Son is in the water, being baptized, God the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and Father God speaking, affirming, uh, affirmation over his son. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. It's a powerful moment, powerful scene. I want you to notice the pattern. 
of the opening of Mark's gospel, he, he ties the link from Isaiah to Jesus and to, to John, the messenger, and to Jesus, the Messiah. He said, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. And then John prophesies in verse seven, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down to tie sandals. Someone's coming soon. Someone's coming soon. Two verses later, one day Jesus came. To me, this is significant because he had to go out to the wilderness to meet John. I mean, Jesus could have said, you know what? Hey, I'm above this. Don't need this. I just love the fact that Jesus got in line. And all of a sudden, John and Jesus meet eyes there he is, the son of God that takes away the sin of the world. And there's this moment where John's like, I should be baptized by you, <laughs> right? There's this tent awkward moment. And, and Jesus say, no, no, I need, to, I need to do this. And we'd talk a lot about that. I, I, a couple things I just wanna deposit into your heart as we get ready to sing and to worship out of here. Jesus' demonstration is this. He will meet you in the wilderness. He will meet you in your wilderness. Jesus will, he stepped out of eternity and into time to meet you in your, in your wilderness. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He stepped out of eternity and he, the Bible, I love the message paraphrase says, he moved into the neighborhood. Why? To be close to his creation. John the Baptist preaches in the wilderness. He baptizes people in the wilderness. Everything about John is wilderness. When you think of wilderness, we're not talking about the Alaska, you know, beautiful tree, things grow, snow. We're, we're talking about the wilderness. The Greek word is the word eremos. It's where nothing grows. It's desert. It's dry. There's no water there. There's nothing of sustenance there. It's a place of thirst. You can't grow things, so there's no bread there. It's a place of loneliness. It's terrible loneliness. You can't support community or life there. And isn't it interesting that throughout scripture, generally speaking, God was a God who met his people in the wilderness. Let me ask you this, where did Moses meet God? In the burning bush, in the wilderness. Where did Jacob wrestle with God face to face? In the wilderness. Where did Israel meet with God? Uh, where did Israel meet with God? Was it in Egypt? No, it was at Sinai. I mean, yes, they love God, but he met with them at Sinai. But listen, listen to this. One commentator writes it this way. At Sinai is where they were made the people of God in principle. The 10 commandments, all of that. But after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness is where they became the people of God in practice. <laughs> God's not intimidated by the wilderness, your wilderness, or my wilderness. Why is the wilderness important? Because it's a place where you meet God. A wilderness is a place, please get this, think about the children of Israel and then think about, bring it home. The wilderness is a place where you can't stay alive without the intervention of God. God, I need you. God, I need you to be near. God, where I'm walking, what I'm walking through, I need you near. I need to know you're here with me. Wells go dry, they need the water of God. Bread gets moldy and stale, you have to have the manna of God. Out in the wilderness, the people of Israel learned what we all have to learn. 
that God's not just to add on, not just to check the box, not a, just a vitamin supplement. That apart from the saving intervention of God, you and I have no hope without him. I like the way C.S. Lewis captures this. And this is how we have to think. Because we have to think this way. Sometimes we put our hope in things that were never intended to be a sustenance. Sometimes we, sometimes we, we put our hope in our job or hope in our health, hope in our finances and our money, hope in a relationship and a marriage. And when that evaporates, when a diagnosis shifts things, that's a wilderness. You're in the wilderness. And if you're not there now, guess what? Probably will be. I'm not prophesying doom on you. I'm just saying, we all walk through wilderness experiences. If I asked for a show of hands right now, how many of you would consider you're in a wilderness? There'd be a lot of hands go up. I like the way C.S. Lewis describes it. And then we're gonna sing a song about our firm foundation, who's Jesus. Listen to this. He explains the wilderness experience. He said, most people, if they really learn how to look into their own hearts, would know what they do want and, they, and what they know acutely cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never keep their promise. Come on, C.S. Lewis. The longings which arise in us when we we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country or first take up our, uh, some subject that excites us. Our longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning, never, never really satisfy. So I'm not speaking about what ordinarily would be called unsuccessful marriages or trips or so on, this C.S. Lewis. <laughs> he said, I'm talking about the best possible ones. There's always something that we grasp at in that first moment of longing that always fades away in the reality. That spouse may be a great spouse. The scenery has been excellent. The job turned out to be pretty good. But what we're really looking for has evaded us. And we find ourselves in the wilderness. And here's what I love when I go back to that passage. Jesus got in line, the Bible says, and one day Jesus showed up like he always has, like he always does. And I want you to see today as we sing, as we worship, I want you to see Jesus coming to your wilderness right now. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. And meeting you right where you're at. Let's worship. Let me say this, we have a prayer light that's gonna go on here in just a moment. And there'll be people under that prayer light that would love to pray with you. Uh, you need somebody to just agree with you. You're walking through a pretty severe wilderness. People that love to pray with you today before we close. Let's worship and I'll come back and close this up.